Okay, guys. So we are going to start um, today talking about Chapter 4. And give me one second just to adjust the volume on this. I think that's all right. So, voting and elections. We're going to start just by talking about political participation in general and the participation paradox. So, the participation paradox is basically the idea that people vote, even though it's their one vote, very rarely influences the outcome of the election. So, what makes somebody likely to vote? or unlikely to vote, and why do we vote? So even though your one vote is very unlikely to carry the entire election, most people say, well, if everybody had that mentality, then you know, no one would get elected, or some crazy guy would get elected, or you know, some variation of that. So you see the sense of group responsibility. In terms of who is most likely to vote, the most important demographic variables you see are education, income, and age. So the more educated you are, the more likely you are to vote. The more income you have, the more likely you are to vote. And the older you are, the more likely you are to vote. Which if we break that down, just kind of quickly, makes sense. So if you're more educated, if you have a graduate degree or a college degree, you probably understand the system a little bit better. Maybe you've had to sit through a government course like this one where you learn what all of these different positions are. That probably makes you more likely to vote. In terms of income level, if you're working a minimum wage job and you don't have any transportation and you're relying on public transit, you're probably less likely to make it to the polls than somebody who's more affluent and who has more access to resources that are easily gonna get them to the polling location of their choice. In terms of age, the older you are, the more relevant things seem to feel to you. If you're paying more in taxes, you probably own your own home. There might be property taxes that you're dealing with as well. You probably care a lot about, you're more likely to care about educational policies that kids are currently dealing with. Um, so the older you get, the more likely you are to vote as well. Political factors can also influence somebody's decision as to whether or not to vote. Political factors such as one's expressed interest in politics and the intensity of identification with political parties influence the likelihood of voting. So if you identify really strongly with the Democrats or you identify really strongly with the Republicans, you're more likely to show up to vote than somebody who's a little bit more middle ground. Okay. So, in terms of voting, who's allowed to vote, remember that the legal qualifications for voting in Texas are surprisingly few and simple. Anyone who is a citizen of the United States, at least 18 years of age, so not a minor, a resident of the state is eligible to register and vote to vote in Texas, assuming that they're not disqualified by one of those other criteria that we talked about. So assuming that they're not declared legally mentally incompetent by a court, and assuming that they're not currently serving a felony conviction of some type, you're gonna be allowed to vote. So when we talk about voter turnout in the United States and in Texas, there are two key terms that you need to know. There's voter turnout and there's voting age population. So voting age population is the total number of people in the United States who are 18 years of age or older who are eligible to vote. Voter turnout is the proportion of eligible Americans who actually vote. So voting age population and voter turnout. Voter turnout is based off of who is actually legally allowed to vote what percentage of those individuals show up at the polls. In Texas, 
we have made it a little bit more difficult for people to vote. Um, we, the legislature enacted a voter photo identification law in 2011, and it requires voters to show one of seven forms of photo identification. Um, the Texas Secretary of State goes out and basically publishes posters and other things prior to election time that are designed to show you what you need to bring with you to the polls in order to vote. So the documents listed are Texas driver's license, Texas ID card, Texas concealed handgun license, U.S. military ID, U.S. passport, U.S. citizenship certificate, or a Texas election identification certificate. Here's kind of the big takeaway from those. They're all government-issued forms of photo identification. So government-issued photo ID. Now, your textbook, I don't know that it really goes into the exceptions, so much, um, but the exceptions are kind of important. Um, here's the thing with these voter identification laws. People are always going to ask, well, what's the big deal, right? Because most middle class or upper middle class citizens, they usually have access to a driver's license, if nothing else. Well, the problem with these voter ID laws is that groups of poor individuals are disproportionately affected by them. So if you're low income, you are less likely to have one of those forms of government issued photo ID. So take, for example, the most commonly used one, driver's license. Okay, well, if you don't have access to a car, if you don't have the driver's license, right? And if you don't have a concealed handgun license, if you don't have a driver's license and you don't have the money to drive, you probably don't have access to a U.S. passport. There's a lot of reasons that there are a whole lot of people who are affected by this voter ID law in Texas. Most of the estimates that I've seen are somewhere between 500,000 to 800,000 individuals are affected. Now, why did we do it? Why did the legislature think it was a good idea? What it was designed to curb is voter fraud, but a very particular type of voter fraud, voter impersonation fraud. So basically where you're claiming to be someone that you're not. Here's the problem with the law as it was originally framed. Because it disproportionately affects low-income individuals, as we learned earlier, low-income individuals in Texas are more likely to be African-American and Latino voters, particularly Latino. And so a federal court basically held that it was not okay and that if free clearance still existed, this would not have occurred. As a result, there needed to be an amendment that was made. The amendment basically provided that you need to show one of those forms of identification or you need to sign an affidavit saying that there is a reasonable impediment to you obtaining one of those forms of photo ID. And also, you would to go in and show some supporting document. So there is now an exception in the law. You have to show one of those forms of photo identification unless you sign that affidavit and bring in uh, the supporting docs that we talked about. Okay, so next up, let's look at how many people vote in the United States presidential election turnout. So you see that this number can differ somewhat. But usually we're looking at somewhere in the 50%-ish range. Um, that's really not great. <laughs> because remember, this is presidential election turnout. So that's when people are most likely to turn out to vote if they're going to at all. And remember that voter turnout is based on individuals who are eligible to vote. So this isn't taking into account anyone else. It's not taking into account minors or anyone who's here um, on a you know green card or some other method of ineligible to vote. Um, this is just the people who are actually eligible. The other thing that's a little bit notable from this graph, if you take a look, is we can see the 1972 election where the voting age was lowered from 21 to 18. You can see a precipitous decline in voter turnout. So. We widened the amount of individuals who are able to come out to the polls and vote, but we saw less people actually do it. And part of why we saw less people in terms of voter turnout is because of that broadening. 
that 18 to 21 range was not very likely to vote. Now, what's surprising about that is that that was in response to what was happening in the United States at the time, the draft of the Vietnam War. So there was a very unpopular war happening and people were being forced to go and fight in that war. Even then, we saw relatively low voter turnout, particularly from our younger generation. So it kind of highlights for you how crazy that is and how important it is, no matter what your age is, to go out and vote. So voter turnout among the world's most democratic nations, you can see here on this chart, reminder, all of your PowerPoints are available in the lessons tab because I know that on Blackboard, they're showing up um, a little small for you. So um, what this is designed to show though, is that usually we've got about 55% turnout. And when we compare that with a lot of other democratic nations, it's not so good. People always ask why at this point, it's for a variety of reasons. Um, some of the factors that influence it are other countries will actually have compulsory voting. So it's not an option whether or not to vote. I mean, it is, but if you don't vote, then you basically pay a tax. So if you went out and asked most people today, who aren't currently voting, if they would rather go vote or they would rather hand the government 40 bucks, they're probably gonna decide to go out and vote. So that's one of the reasons. The other is that on the whole, most of these other nations make it really accessible to people to vote. So they try to make it as convenient as possible. They usually have a national voting day, everybody gets the day off or they hold their elections on weekends. That's obviously not the case here um, in the United States. We have our elections on Tuesday, um, which is not particularly convenient for most people. Um, so that also decreases voter participation. Most of those other countries are also not going to see things like that voter ID law that we saw. Um, as soon as preclearance went away, we saw a whole lot more restrictions come about in those states that were previously under preclearance. And that also, you know, helped to drop the voter participation that we see in our country. So there's a lot of different factors at play, but we're not exactly setting the world on fire when it comes to our voter participation and turnout. This next slide here is just designed to show you where we rank, generally speaking, in terms of presidential general election turnout. So again, presidential election turnout is going to be where we see the most voter participation um, among the states. And in Texas, usually we're ranking around 49. So that's second to last, that is not great. Until you compare it <laughs> with our non-presidential general elections, where for the last several years, we've been like ranking dead last. Um, so we're gonna talk about what are some of the things that account for that. As you can see, when your textbook was published, they hadn't yet been able to generate the 2018 data, but hopefully in the next publication that will be coming. Okay, I have puppy dogs barking at me um, in the backyard. So we're gonna take a brief break here, um, collect your thoughts, look at your notes, um, run to the restroom. I'll be back in about one minute. Sorry about that, guys. So I'm back, and we are talking about presidential election turnout and non-presidential election turnout and how we rank and why that might be. So we've already talked about some of the potential reasons. Remember, age, income, and education 
are all going to impact whether or not somebody is likely to turn out to vote. And we already know from chapter one that we have a very large low income population in the state of Texas. Remember, we've got 25% of the potential unfunded Medicaid beneficiaries. So we've got a lot of people living at or below the poverty line or just above. We also tend to have a population that isn't as well educated as a lot of other states. So that's going to impact us. And then we have that current voter ID law in effect, which whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing, um, does deter um, a fair amount of individuals from voting. 500 to 800,000 people is not an insignificant number. So let's talk about some of the other constraints that we've seen on individuals' ability to participate. So legal constraints, we've talked about the current one. Historically, Texas was among the most restrictive states in its voting law. It instituted things like the poll tax. That was where you had to go and pay money in order to vote. The money for somebody who was more affluent wasn't really all that much, but was usually equivalent to a day laborer salary for the day. And so if you were very much living hand to mouth, that was a big deal for you. And it prohibited you from turning out and voting. Women's suffrage, prior to that point, remember 1920, women couldn't vote. Restrictions on voting when it came to a long residence requirement. So previously, you were required to be a, a resident of the state of Texas for at least six months. That deprived a lot of people of the ability to vote because what happened if you moved from Florida over to Texas, but you only been there for two months? Well, you're not eligible to vote in Florida anymore, but then you also weren't eligible to vote in Texas. Annual registration requirements, that was where every year you had to go in and you had to fill out a new election identification certificate. Early registration requirements, so where you'd have to register way, way, way in advance. And also the linking of prospective jurors from the voting rules. So unfortunately, most people don't want to be on jury duty. And so when we link voter participation to having to serve on juries, what happened was a lot of people were like, that's cool, I just won't vote. <laughs> um, all of those things have been done away with at this point. Um, they've been changed by amendments to the U.S. Constitution, state and national laws, rulings by the U.S. Department of Justice and judicial decisions. But remember, what happens historically affects what happens today. So that's some of what accounts for our really pretty low turnout. Demographically, more than 4 million people live in poverty in Texas. <clears throat> Given that income and education that we talked about, not super surprising that on the demographic front, we see low voter turnout. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm like recording back to back. So <laughs> when, when you hear that, that's just my voice kind of giving out. Um, okay. So from a political structure perspective, Texas uses a long ballot that may call for the voter to choose from as many as 150 to 200 candidates vying for 50 or more offices. The frequency of referendums on constitutional amendments contributes to the length of the ballot in Texas. In addition, voters are also asked to go to the polls for various municipal, school board, bond, and special district elections. What that means is people get fatigued at some point. It's really hard to know about all of those different candidates, all of those different elections. And so a lot of people just throw up their hands and kind of walk away. So while the long ballot was initially designed to encourage participation so that the citizens had more say over their elected officials, in reality, oftentimes it's first participation. Party competition. With very rare exception, the races between candidates of the two parties in Texas have not been competitive. This tends to dampen voter interest in turnout. It's going to be interesting this November to see whether or not that holds true, um, because in recent polling, um, when I was reporting this on May 5th, um, Texas Tribune, um, their poll showed Biden only five points behind President Trump. Um, and then a poll that came out by a different group about five days later actually showed Biden ahead by one point. 
So that is a much, much, much closer rate than we have historically seen um, in Texas for those electoral college votes. So I would maybe anticipate that some of that might change here in the future, but we shall see. Um, and also political culture accounts for some of that lack of participation. So low voter turnout um, can be a mix of the traditionalistic and individualistic styles that we tend to see in Texas. As a result, participation in politics is not as highly regarded as it is in other states, particularly those with a more moralistic culture. That's also something that if you look back on that graph, the United States as compared to other countries, the United States on the whole tends to be more individualistic in nature. We tend to be concerned about individual rights a lot more than other countries are. A lot of other countries have much more the perspective of communal good. And so they see voting as a civic responsibility and a duty. And they take Sorry, dogs barking. They've been shut out of the office. Um, okay, so they're actually going to take some degree of umbrage when they see people not voting because they see that as hurting the communal good. In Texas, we tend to be even more individualistic than the rest of the state. So part of why we see this low voter participation and low voter turnout is going to have to deal with political culture. And then this is just a little picture that your textbook provides. Okay, so let's talk about the structure of elections in Texas. So remember, we had started talking about primary elections before. And in Texas, we have direct primaries. Direct primaries are a method of selecting party nominees in which party members participate directly in the selection of a candidate to represent them in the general election. So remember when we talked about it in the context of the white primary, this is where individuals go out and they decide which candidate do I want to appear from my party on the general election ballot? Who has to hold a primary in Texas? Any party receiving 20% of the gubernatorial vote or more in the prior election, and the others must use a convention. So most of the primary's cost, where does it come from? Most of the primary's cost is gonna come from the state treasury. In terms of who's going to win a primary, primaries are won by majority rule. So that means that we need to have greater than 50% of the voters vote for that candidate in order for them to make it to the general election ballot. If they don't, then we have what's called a runoff primary. A runoff primary is just going to be a secondary primary election. It's going to pit the two top vote getters from the first primary against each other, when the winner of the first primary did not receive a majority. So let's switch over to the whiteboard just really quick to show you how this might occur. Okay. So let's say you've got three candidates, say so we're going to have candidate one, candidate two, and candidate three. Let's say candidate one gets, what do we want them to get? Let's say they get 33% of the vote. And let's say candidate two gets 34% of the vote. And let's say candidate three gets 32% of the vote. Doesn't add up exactly, but you get the idea. Okay, well, candidate two, while receiving the most votes, didn't receive more than 50% of the vote. And that's not uncommon to see in a race that has more than two candidates. So as a result of this, what you would see is candidate three is going to be crossed out 
and candidate one and two are going to be pitted against one another. So now the people who were voting for candidate three can go in instead and vote for either one or two. And whichever one is going to come out with greater than 50% is going to be the individual who wins that election. So let's go back now to our slides. Okay, in order to be listed on the primary ballot in Texas, there are filing fees with these selected offices. Notice they're going to increase. And so the increase there can be good, but it can also be bad. It can deter individuals from frivolously putting their name on the primary ballot. But the flip side to that is that it also makes it more difficult for individuals who are lower income to get on the ballot in the first place. So you can see here, just the peace constable positions will range anywhere from $375 to $1,000 in terms of fees. But if we're looking at U.S. Senator, that can get all the way up to $5,000, which for most people is a fair amount of money. Okay, there are two different types of primary systems. There's an open primary and a closed primary. An open primary is a type of party primary in which a voter can choose on election day in which primary to participate. A closed primary is a type of primary in which a voter is required to specify a party's preference when registering to vote. So open primaries get to decide that day of the primary election. Do I want to be a Democrat today or do I want to be a Republican today? Closed primary, you were pre-registered in advance. You declared yourself to be a Republican or a Democrat. Texas uses the open primary system, which allows for something called crossover voting. Crossover voting is when members of one political party vote in the other party's primary to influence the election or sorry, the selection of the nominee. So traditionally, you consider yourself a Republican but you go and you vote in the Democratic primary. Or traditionally, you consider yourself a Democrat, but you go and you vote in the Republican primary. That's what crossover voting is. Now, the reason that some states allow it, like Texas, is we have a really long tradition of being a one-party state. For a very long time, we were Democrats, and now for a relatively long period of time, we've been Republicans. Crossover voting allows somebody from the opposite party to have a meaningful voice and who ultimately gets elected into office. So that's what's good about it. It also allows for people to be a little bit more flexible in terms of their party affiliation. Maybe I really want to vote based on the individual candidate and not just based on the party. I want to see what their party platform is. It allows me more discretion as somebody who's not fully Democrat or fully Republican to go in and really weigh the candidate. So, so those are some of the good things. Now, what are some of the bad things about that? Um, bad things <laughs> would be that it's going to make your political party probably a little bit more moderate than what the people who are extremely liberal or extremely conservative are comfortable with. When you have crossover voting, it tends to dilute things a little bit. The other part to that is that you can sabotage the other team. So if you think it's going to be a really close race, really hotly contested between the Democrats and the Republicans on general election day, you could try to sabotage the other party. So if you were a Democrat, you could say, well, this Republican candidate is unlikely to win against my guy, but this Republican candidate is likely to win. So I'm going to vote for the one who's unlikely because I really want my guy on the Democratic side to win or vice versa. So crossover voting provides a little bit of a trade-off to flip. General elections are gonna be won by a plurality vote. So remember we said primaries, you've gotta get a majority, which is greater than 50%. Plurality just means you had to win the most votes. So if we thought back on our example from before, and we looked at at the whiteboard, 
for candidate one had 33, candidate two had 34, and candidate three had 32. Well, instead of making the two top vote getters hit against one another, here it'd just be candidate two who got the most votes, 34% who would win. That's a plurality. So an election rule in which the candidate with the most votes wins, even if the candidate gets less than 50%, that's a plurality vote. General elections are won by plurality, so just who got the most votes. There's something called special elections. These occur for special or emergency needs. Special elections are held to fill vacancies only in legislative bodies that have general rather than limited lawmaking power. And in that situation, the winner, again, needs to go back to getting a majority of the vote, so greater than 50%. This next slide is really just designed to give those of you who are a little bit more visual an overview of what the election process looks like in Texas. So you can see the first step is getting on that primary ballot, like we talked about, paying the filing fees associated with it. March primary, that's where we figure out, hopefully, who's going to be on the general election ballot. But remember, if we didn't get greater than 50% of the vote, then we're going to have to go to a runoff primary, which is going to be held in May. And then finally, we've got here the November general election. So this figure is just showing the steps major party candidates have to take to win office in Texas. In March and May of even numbered years, that's when we're holding those primaries, either the general primary or the runoff primary. And general elections are public elections held in November. So voters can actually decide who will win office. And at that general election, remember, it's not just Republicans and Democrats. Any other independents that are listed will be available as well. Okay. So let's talk about the different types of ballots um, that there can be. So there's the office block ballot and there's the party column ballot. And the office block ballot is a type of ballot used in a general election where the names of the party candidates are listed randomly under each office. A party column ballot is a type of ballot used in a general election in which all of the candidates from each party are listed in parallel columns under the party label. So party column ballot, the true party column ballot, is going to have the option to go in and straight ticket vote. That's where you get to check a box and select all of the candidates of one particular party. They're also going to have the party that won the last gubernatorial election listed first because it's actually been shown statistically um, that the person who's listed first is more likely to be the person who wins, which is crazy, but is true. Um, and also, you're going to see a designation of Republican and Democrat there. An office block ballot, the true office block ballot, is going to provide candidates in random order. And there's not going to be that straight ticket voting option where you can just check the box. In fact, there's not going to be a party designation next to the candidate's name. So they're going to actually win or lose based on their platform. Shocking, I know. So that office block ballot, what it's designed to encourage is something called split ticket voting. This is where a voter goes in and selects candidates from one party for some offices and candidates from the other party for other offices. So it's designed to really make you think and decide based on each individual candidate who would best serve in that office. In Texas, we've actually had some changes to our ballot. So for those of you who voted, you know that you go in and there will be a designation of Republican or Democrat next to the name. But it used to be that you could go in and straight ticket vote. Um, just recently, that was changed. So now there should potentially be more split ticket voting occurring. Okay. So the major parties in Texas are going to support the use of the party column ballot. Um, for a name to be placed on the general election ballot, the candidate has to either be a party nominee or an independent. 
Ballot construction. The secret ballot and the Australian ballot. So the Australian ballot is a ballot printed by the government as opposed to the political parties that allows people to vote in secret. The reason that voting in secret is so important to our democracy and really any good democracy is because without it, people are gonna be subject to intimidation and coercion. So if everybody knows who you voted for, then somebody could go threaten to harm you or harm your family or to bribe you or to bribe your family for you to have to vote a particular way. We don't want that to occur. And so the secrecy of our ballot and of our election process becomes a really big deal to us. One thing that has remained on our current ballot um, and has remained in the VRA is this idea of multilingualism, the idea that we want you to be able to vote even if your primary language is not English. So if we're looking at a population that has a really heavy concentration of individuals who speak a language other than English as their primary language, like Harris County, for example, has a very large Vietnamese population, then ballots in that county have to be printed in not only English, but also Vietnamese. Again, we're only talking about United States citizens, residents of Texas who don't meet any of those disqualifying criteria who are eligible to vote. And so if you meet all of those things, we don't want you to not be able to vote simply because your first language is in English. If you're a United States citizen and a resident of Texas, the prevailing general rule is that you should be able to vote unless you meet one of those disqualifying criteria. So we print languages, we print languages, we print ballots in other languages as well. Early voting is something that's really taken hold not only in the United States, but in Texas as a whole. And early voting is the practice of voting before election day at traditional voting locations, such as schools and other locations, such as grocery and convenience stores. So it's basically where you don't have to wait until the general election day when maybe you have a lot of other things going on. Like we said before, it's held on a Tuesday. People have busy lives. So this allows you to go to a different polling location that maybe is uh, more accessible to you and easier for you to access and, and during times that are maybe a little bit easier for you to access as well. Okay, think back on that participation paradox that we talked about before. Um, don't get disheartened, <laughs> but it becomes even more of a paradox when we understand that vote counting contains errors. Texas candidates are actually able to request a recount if he or she loses by less than 10%. Now, traditional voting range is not that large. Usually when we're talking about voting error rates, we're talking about a range of about one to 2%. Don't freak out. <laughs> um, but there is still some degree of error, which means that your vote could potentially be miscalculated um, or fail to be counted at all. We give Texas candidates this option to go in and request this recount, but here's the catch. If you lose on the recount, then you're responsible for paying for that recount vote. So while you could go in and request a recount if you lost by 8%, that's well above the margin of general error that we see. And so unless you think there was like widespread fraud, that's probably going to a huge waste of everybody's time, but also from an individualistic perspective, a huge waste of your money because you're going to have to pay for that recount. So although Texas candidates can request a recount if they lose by less than 10%, usually there's a much closer margin than that if we see a recount occur. Electronic voting. Electronic voting has popped up largely in response to some of the counting or lack of counting of ballots that we saw in the Bush versus Gore presidential election. And for those of you who weren't alive, um, which I understand that basically dates me, um, there was this really big deal called hanging Chad. So the presidential election was basically going to be won by the electoral votes in Florida. It was a very close race. Whoever won Florida was going to win the presidency. 
what happened was a lot of people would push through on their paper ballot the nominee that they wanted, but the part of their ballot that was supposed to fall to the ground, that was supposed to be just poked out and fall, didn't fall. It hung on the ballot so that when it went through the machine, that part that had hung on that was supposed to be totally pushed out got pushed out. And so their ballot didn't count. That hanging part was known as the hanging tax. As a result of that, we moved a lot more towards electronic voting. But I would guess that we're probably going to have to do some improvements on electronic voting as well in the future. Um, because as we saw with 2016, there is obviously the potential for hacking, and that is obviously a bad thing that we don't want. So no system is perfect, but we have moved more towards the electronic voting. Okay. So let's talk about the general election campaign. We've got past the primaries and now we are out there and we're trying to actually be selected um, to be the actual person who serves in office. We're going to have to focus on mobilizing groups. We have a whole chapter, chapter six, that's devoted to mobilizing special interest groups. Um, so those are groups who are really politically active and care about a particular cause, usually a social cause, but it can be an economic cause as well. So we're going to have to focus on moving those groups. And we're going to have to choose issues that are important to our base. When we talk about our political base, we're talking about the people who are likely to come out and vote for us. Those tend to be the people who are either the most conservative or the most liberal. We're also going to have to decide on how we're going to conduct ourselves on the campaign trail. Negative campaigning has become a really large part of politics, both on the Texas stage and also on the national stage. So negative campaigning is a strategy used in election campaigns in which candidates attack their opponent's issue positions or character. So instead of running a campaign ad that talks about all of the great things that you've done and all of the things that you believe in, instead you focus on all of the bad things that you're opponent has done and all of the bad things that your opponent believes in. Unfortunately, we've seen a large shift towards this. Um, the last time we saw a big push for real meaningful positive campaigning was in the Obama-McCain election. Um, John McCain actually did an exceptional job of VP didn't necessarily, but he did an exceptional job of trying to maintain a positive message. And there's a very famous clip of him going in and actually correcting one of his potential voters who was at a rally um, where he told her in very clear terms that um, Barack Obama is a good man who fundamentally disagreed with him on some policy decisions. Um, you can actually watch it on YouTube. It's a pretty remarkable moment. And at this point in our political history, it's kind of refreshing to see. The unfortunate part about that is, obviously, that doesn't win elections. <laughs> so um, McCain, spoiler alert, McCain was not elected um, to be president of the United States. Um, and part of what that kind of solidified in the political mind, unfortunately, was that the system of positive campaigning doesn't work as well as negative campaign. Um, so it's unfortunate, but it's unfortunate. In terms of timing, you used to see a blitz of these advertisements right before the general election day. But as we learned earlier on today, there has been a push towards more early voting. And so you tended to see a larger space of time in which you see these campaign advertisements. Money and political action comes. Usually, in my regular courses, um, when life is insane and the plague has a hit, we usually move this portion with PAC over to the part where we talk about special interest groups, because I feel like it makes more sense over there. But since we're doing everything textbook coordinated, we're going to talk about it now. 
to pack the short for political action committee. These are organizations that raise and then contribute money to political candidates. So when we talk about special interest groups later on, those special interest groups are really devoted to mobilizing members. PACs are really devoted to generating money for elections. There's this really important case that came out called Citizens United versus FEC. And the case was about this documentary that this particular group, Citizens United, wanted to air. And it was about Hillary Clinton. But it wasn't any of the good things about Hillary Clinton. It was all of the things that they thought were bad about Hillary Clinton. Well, they were subject to campaign rules and limitations. The federal government, in the form of the FEC, has placed limitations on money that's raised and advertisements that go out in elections because they have this overwhelming concern that people who are more affluent are going to be able to control elections, and they didn't want that to happen. Well, the, the Citizens United group didn't like the idea that the FEC could go in and restrict all of this stuff with regards to their documentary, and so they appealed it to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court, in that case, said that when it comes to soft money, independent expenditures, there cannot be a cap on what can contribute. Let's break down those vocabulary terms before we go farther. Soft money is money spent by political parties on behalf of political candidates, especially for the purposes of increasing voter registration and turnout. Independent expenditure, money that individuals and organizations spend to promote a candidate without working or communicating directly with the candidate's campaign organization. So what Citizens United was doing was they weren't coordinating with the political candidate that they liked in any way. So they weren't, at least on the record, having any sort of discernible relationship with the political candidate that they supported. They were deciding when they were going to air this documentary on their own. They weren't coordinating that in any way with any campaign. They weren't saying, we're thinking about airing it in these markets, candidates that I like, what do you think about that? They were doing it totally on their own. It was an independent expenditure. And it was soft money because they weren't out directly campaigning for the candidate that they liked, right? Instead, what they were doing is they were saying all these things that were bad about the candidates they didn't like. What the United States Supreme Court said is when it comes to soft money, independent expenditure, we're going to allow tax to raise and contribute unlimited sums in the form of super PAC. The reason they said this is they felt like these groups of people were demonstrating their First Amendment rights when they contributed money. Because when they contributed money, what they were doing is they were saying something. So in the case of this documentary, they felt like that contribution of money, what it was designed to do was say, we don't like Hillary Clinton. And so the justices were really concerned Concerned about abridging individual First Amendment freedom. Now, the result of Citizens United, though, is that you do tend to see a lot more business interests dominating politics because they're able to raise and contribute unlimited sums when it comes to soft money independent expenditure. And that's really what that next slide shows the profiles of Texas campaign mega donors. So you can see here that for the most part, we're looking at businesses and professionals that are campaigning. And we really don't have an equal playing field for our consumer group. What is this resulting in terms of who ultimately ends up 
getting elected. Well, elected officials um, can oftentimes use you to sort of a pyramid structure. And successful candidates are typically Anglo males. That does not mean that other individuals can't successfully make it to office. Um, Ann Richards was a very well-known Texas governor. Um, she's obviously not male. Um, and we've seen some gains that women's and minorities are making, but on the whole, we do tend to see more males and more Anglos in Texas state office than minorities or women. Texas campaign finance regulations, just to kind of put an asterisk on this, are designed to hold public officials and campaign contributors accountable um, by shining the light on publicity of them. Um, but basically what that Citizens United decision was saying was we have to be careful about balancing that with First Amendment free. So that is chapter four for you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and end that here. If you have any questions, feel free to email me, or as always, we can set up an individual Blackboard Collaborate session for you. Um, I know that during the long semester, sometimes when we're crunched for time and somebody's having a difficult go of it, um, we'll, I'll kind of go through and diagram things for them, um, which we can still do in Blackboard Collaborate on the whiteboard. So if you find that you're a visual learner and you're getting kind of stuck when it comes to learning in the online format, let me know um, and we can figure out a time when we can meet together and look at the whiteboard together. Okay, so that does it for chapter four.